And indeed, he is worthy. He is wonderful. He is good. And uh, I hope this is a bit of a different message because it's uh, more of a, a big picture about what God is doing. But I think sometimes when we can see perhaps a little bit of a bird's eye view, it helps us to just be awestruck at how awesome and wonderful and incredible is our God. And, uh, s and that leads to worship. Praise the Lord. So, anyways, I wanted to I talk to you <laughs> about, well, it, it's something that has just reemerged in my life, uh, actually, with, you know, I put on my do not disturb, so... This is Dean Bai. Oh, God, this is fun. Okay. Hang on here. Are you okay with this? This better be good, Dean, because I'm just about to preach a message at Temple Yeshua. So you, this better be good. Uh oh. Listen, I just wanted to have a private conversation with you. I didn't realize that you're with friends. God bless them. You know, I put my phone on Do Not Disturb, but somehow you got through. I, I'm not sure how. But uh, is there anything you want to say to the nice people, Dean? Well, we are living in the most exciting time since resurrection and Yeshua HaMashiach. You know that, Marty. Are you going to tell the people about that? Yeah, actually, I am. <laughs> oh. Well, listen, I, I, I don't want to bother you any longer, but maybe after... You get a break, you might want to call your buddy back. And, you know, you should share with your friends. It's time with your friends and not just keep teaching all the time. You know that? <laughs> okay. You have to relate. There has to be a time where we just sort of nosh together and love one another. Amen. And, and then others are going to know our love for one another, uh, and, and they will know the Lord. Don't you get it? I do. I do. That sounds okay. good. Okay, we love you. God bless you. Shalom, shalom, shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay, well, that's a first. I've been interrupted by Dean many, many times, but not on the phone. So, uh, wow. All right, I hope that was okay, and you have grace for that kind of thing. Uh, you'll get over it? Good, good, good. Yeah, some churches, that would be very scandalous for the preacher to take a phone call. <laughs> In the mid before he gets going, but you know, not here. You're all right. He's he's a dear brother. God is using him. Uh, Dean has been in uh, the United States since August, if you could believe this, and I think he's in Kansas City right now, uh, hanging out with Mike Bickle, and uh, and also um, oh dear. What's his name? You know, the guy who prays like this. Lou Engel, yeah. And, you know, they're just, re he's, he, they're receiving the message of Aliyah. It's amazing what's going on, yeah. So I, I, you'll have to get Dean over here to talk to you about it. But I got a different message, okay? But it's very, very exciting that, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Lou Engel had a dream about a year ago where God said, the time is for, for the church to become the Ruth Church. And this is the mandate for the church to recognize that we must come alongside Naomi and, and love her and support her and say, your God is my God, and wherever you go, I will go. Isn't that incredible? This, this man has been praying for revival in America and, you know, to end abortion. This is what the Lord spoke to him. And now he's saying, yes, I'm totally in. So praise the Lord. God is doing amazing things. And maybe it is a little bit of a segue where Dean likes to say, we are living in the most exciting time since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> praise the Lord. But, you know, it's true. It's true. We are seeing things in our day that have never, ever been seen before. And actually, I'm talking to you. 
this morning about one of those times. Uh, Bill and I, as we were driving in from the ferry this morning, we're saying, you know, this, is, this has never happened in history before. So we're going to talk a little bit about Isaac and Ishmael and the restoration of Abraham's family. Uh, you know, now in a congregation like this, we talk a lot about Jew and Gentile together as one new man. And of course, I think this is our emphasis and this is the trajectory of all of God's dealings with the planet and uh, to bring in a company from every nation, tribe, and tongue and to bring restoration back to the stock of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so that uh, there would be this wonderful company. The family will be complete, one new man in Christ. Amen? But there's a dimension of this uh, coming together that is unique to Abraham's family. And this has a significant part to play in what God is doing. And I was at a conference uh, two weeks ago. I was invited to speak at a conference, and it was a, a conference about the reunification or the restoration of the relationship between Isaac and Ishmael. And there were uh, quite a number of believers there who came from a Muslim background and had dramatic, dramatic encounters with the Lord where he revealed himself to them and maybe you've heard about this, where uh, throughout the Middle East, God is appearing to people in dreams. Uh, they call it the man in white. Have you ever heard about this? Yeah, you have. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, yeah, people, they have a dream where Yeshua appears to them, and he's always dressed in white. And he, he tells them, I am Jesus. One time I was in California, I met this Iranian lady. It's kind of a funny story uh, about this, but this happened to her. She had just moved to California from Iran, and she was making her way in the United States. And she had this dream, and Yeshua appeared to her, dressed in white, and said, I am Jesus. And he didn't really say anything else. And she woke up, and she didn't know who, who's Jesus. I'd never heard of Jesus. And uh, the next day, she was at work, and she was overhearing some colleagues who were believers talking about Jesus. She got all excited. Said, oh, wow. So she joined this group and said, uh, hey, yeah, who is this Jesus? He appeared to me last night in a dream and told me he was Jesus, but then he left. Can you tell me a little bit about him? And <laughs> could you imagine what it was like for them? And then they led her to the Lord. And she's serving the Lord ever since. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God's got a sense of humor too. But some of them had very, very dramatic encounters. One brother testified where he saw Yeshua dressed in white, wearing a talit. That's amazing, right? To somebody from a Muslim background, wearing a talit with his hands outstretched. And he could see the, the nail prints in his hands saying, I am Jesus. I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Whew. Isn't that amazing? So I have to tell you a little bit about my story because, uh, you know, I was a good Jewish boy raised in Montreal, you know. Um, I was just a little boy when the Six-Day War happened and... Uh, you know, and then there was the Yom Kippur War. I, I was, you know, maybe 13 or something like that. Um, I had this sort of not, not you know, I have, to, I have to admit, when I thought about the people of the Middle East, other than the Jews of Israel, I wasn't uh, exactly full of warm, fuzzy feelings. And, you know, when I became a believer and I read in Genesis 16 about Ishmael where it says he will be a wild donkey of a man and his hand will be against his brothers and his brother's hands against him and 
And I was just, yeah, that's, that's Ishmael, and that's all I need to know about Ishmael, this wild donkey who's always fighting with everybody. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what the scripture says, but that's not the whole story. And I didn't have a good attitude. I had prejudice in my heart against uh, Ishmael and those who derive out of the stock of Ishmael. But, you know, something happened to me once where I, uh, and we'll get to it, we're going to go through the scriptures a little bit, where I had an awakening to understand that that's not all there is to the story. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to visit the story. Now, you know what happened. Uh, God had promised Abraham descendants like the stars in the sky. And, uh, you know, such a dramatic encounter with the Lord in Genesis 15 to assure him of the covenant. But time continues to roll on, and there is no child. And so Sarah has an idea and says, you know, look, take my maid, Hagar, and, uh, you know, I can have a child through her, which I guess was a common practice in those days. This is you know, the original surrogate motherhood was you would uh, have a maidservant, uh, you know, conceive on behalf of a barren uh, mistress. So it wasn't like this was uncommon and this was completely against the pale of what was in the culture in those days. So from one perspective, you could understand why they would do this. This was fairly common practice. But on the other hand, as we read in the scriptures, as Paul likes to explain, one child is the son, uh, you know, born of the flesh versus the other son, the son of promise, born of the spirit. And, you know, we do get this sense that maybe this wasn't exactly the plan of God. And also, we tend to, I think, and for good reason, I mean, you know, we have to account for Galatians chapter 4, where... Paul talks about this. We look at this just as a mistake. Sometimes you ever wonder, oh, wouldn't have life been so much easier on planet Earth if they had just waited and there was no Ishmael and then we wouldn't have all these problems like we do. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? Our God is so incredible that even those things that seem like mistakes in the end serve his purposes. And I have to think that in some ways this was not a mistake as we go through the story because it brings glory to God. So yes, on one level a mistake, and on another level still, I mean, who knows the mind of the Lord as Paul tells us in Romans 11. It's way past finding out, amen? But there's something here in the plan of God. All right, so... Um, Let's pick up the story with Hagar. She's pregnant, and her countenance changes towards her mistress, and uh, Sarah is not having any of this. And Hagar runs away into the wilderness. She's all, you know, things are not going well. And, uh, ah, thank you very much. And what do we read here? We read about the angel of the Lord found her. Now, Something significant right away here. This is the first mention of the angel of the Lord. Now, who is this person? Amen. I got somebody in the back row who's really on to this message. Uh, yes. And we're going to see a little later on in chapter 16, there's a confirmation. It's not just an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, which, of course, we read, much more prominently about in the book of Exodus, the angel of the Lord is, uh, it seems, as we read through the scriptures uh, with the eyes of understanding that this is a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Son of God. Jesus, first mention of Jesus, well, other than Genesis chapter 1, I'd say, but uh, anyways... First mention of the angel of the Lord is here with Hagar. And the angel of the Lord found her, and he said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring 
so they cannot be numbered for multitude. And isn't that true? And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Yishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Because Adonai Shema, we sang the Shema, right, at the beginning of our service. Shema is, hear, O Israel, listen, pay attention. You will call this child, Jesus is telling Hagar, you will call this child, God will hear. Because he has heard your affliction. He has listened to your affliction. And then, of course, we get this description about him being the wild donkey and his hand against everyone and everyone's hands against him. But there's, like I said, more to the story. And if you go to the next slide, or maybe I can do it, will that work? Yeah. So here we understand it's not just an angel because she said she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. So who is she saying spoke to her? God, the God who sees, the God of seeing, the Lord, yud He vav He. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Now there's something also incredible here. She names him El Ra'i, which means the God who, uh, the seeing God, the God who sees. Uh, in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham names, calls, names the place where God intervened and provided a ram for sacrifice. And he, uh, in that place, he, talk, he calls the Lord Adonai Ireh. Or sometimes we like to say in English, Jehovah Jireh. But you know, Ireh and Ra'i, are you hearing? It's really uh, two different versions of the same Hebrew word. One's a, uh, well, I'm not going to get into the whole grammar thing, but essentially it's, they're both based on the Hebrew word to see. And so she says, you are the God who sees. And Abraham says, you are the Lord who will see, who will provide. But really, the sentiment is the same here in Genesis 16, because what she says, truly here I've seen him who looks after me. Who sees me is actually what it says in Hebrew. Who provides for me? Who cares for me? And you see there's this incredible interconnection here about hearing and seeing and God saying, I, have, I will hear, and God is, is the one who sees, and God will see. Uh, you get the sense, don't you, here of God's connection to this family to humanity, to bringing about his purposes. He sees what's happening, he hears what's happening, and everything eventually will come into place to fulfill God's plan. So there's this foreshadowing of Genesis 22 with Isaac and Abraham here in the uh, Yeshua's encounter as the angel of the Lord with Hagar. Now, at the end of chapter 16 in Genesis, it says, uh, Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. But when we start Genesis 17, we read that Abraham was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him. So that's 13 years. And I mean, maybe this sort of is emphasizing the mistake part of this equation you know they sort of they took matters into their own hands god said you can have a son but they were hasty we sometimes get hasty yet and then he has to wait 13 years i'm not saying god never spoke to abraham for 13 years but i think it's pretty clear that there's a message here he was 86 years old when ishmael was born and then we read he's 99 years old and he appears to Abraham. Uh, and what does God say to him? I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. 
be blameless, be perfect, like Noah was blameless in his generation. Noah was a righteous man and walked with God. And the Lord is saying to Abraham, no more monkey business, no more doing your own thing. You, you know, straighten up and fly right. Amen? You walk perfect before me. And, uh, and Avram, his response is to fall on his face. And that in this chapter, chapter 17, there's a reiteration, a renewal of the covenant, and God changes Avram's name to Abraham. Abraham. And uh, just very quickly, this is essentially a, you know, uh, a reiteration of what God had already told Abraham in Genesis 15. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give you the land of Canaan and to, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Now, when we talk about the covenant God made with Abraham, really, this is where ultimately it is going. What is God's choosing of Abraham really all about? It is so that we would be his people and he would be our God, that we would know him, and we would be known by him, even as, and we would know him even as we are known. This is where the whole trajectory of Scripture is moving. Yes, this is the covenant. This is the blessing. This is God's aspiration for all of humanity, that we would truly be his, and we would know him. Praise the Lord. But something quite incredible that I didn't see because all I thought about was Ishmael being a wild donkey. I, you know, uh, about, it's over 20 years ago, actually. I'm actually, uh, in my little fellowship that I'm a part of, I'm doing a, a, a study on Genesis, but 20 some years ago in a church that I was attending, I was uh, teaching a Bible study on Genesis. And I came to Genesis 17, and I saw something here that I'd never seen before. Uh, Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. What is Abraham asking? God had just said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to give you the covenant blessings and promises that I've made to you. And, you know, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed so that your people will be, uh, you know, the people of God and I will be your God. And Abraham is saying, yes, Lord, and may all these covenant blessings pass from me to my son Ishmael. May he live before you. May you truly be his God, and may he truly be your people. This is Abraham's heart of love for his son Ishmael. And I, I never saw it. But our father Abraham loves his son Ishmael. So much so that he put this son before the Lord said, may all these promises pass through him. But the Lord answers him in a kind of an unusual way. It's a double-edged answer. Because the first and immediate response is no. In other words, I know what you're asking. You're asking that all the covenant promises would pass through Ishmael. All that I've promised you will go through his line. And he says, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now, I, did I mention this? That when the angel of the Lord tells Hagar, you will call him Ishmael, this is the first time in the scriptures where God 
directs a parent to name a child before it is born. First time is Ishmael. The second time, Isaac. The third time, John the Baptist. The fourth time, Jesus, Yeshua. There's only four in the scriptures where God intervenes before the child is born and says, you are to name the child so-and-so. Ishmael is the first. But here God says, Ye Sarah will have a son. Even though she is so old and you are so old, you are going to have this child of promise. And through him, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. The covenant blessings pass through Isaac and then to Jacob and then through the 12 tribes of Israel uh, to everyone else. Amen. We are grafted in to Israel. But then there's another dimension of God's answer here, which is so important. But as for Ishmael, I have heard you. And if you don't know that Ishmael means God will hear, you miss the word play. Because essentially what God is saying is, as for the one that I have named, I will hear, I have heard. Now in Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord tells Hagar, name him, God will hear, because God has heard your affliction. Now, in response to Abraham's cry for his son, the cry of love, God says, as for the one named God will hear, I have heard. What does that mean? Oh, that Ishmael will live before you. And God says, as the one I named, I will hear, I have heard. Whew! So there's something here beyond just the wild donkey and the fighting. There is the promise that Ishmael will come into the family of God. And God will be his God. And he will be his people. And we need to hold on to that. We need to see this is part of the plan of God. Now, let's just one more time see this hear and heard. And you know what happened. Uh, Isaac is born and things again are not so good between Hagar and Sarah and between Ishmael and Isaac. And Hagar is sent away. And the angel of God calls to her. By the way, this is the first mention of the angel of God in the scriptures. Do you notice? There's got to be something very special here because we have these uh, first mentions over and over again. What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. And God was with the boy. And that's really all I wanted to say about this. God we have this three times God has heard in relation to the one named God will hear. That's got to mean something. And the most significant, of course, is as for your request regarding that he might live before me, the one I've named I will hear, I have heard you. Wow. Wow. Well, okay, I want to just move on a little bit because, uh, you know, of course, we know about Isaac, we know about Ishmael, but there are other sons of Abraham. We read about them in Genesis 25. I want to go through this kind of quickly, but you see, there was uh, another wife, Keturah, who bore, after Sarah died, who bore uh, six sons to Abraham. And then in Genesis 25, those first six verses, I've highlighted three 
of the offspring in red, we're going to get to it, one son Midian and two uh, grandsons, Sheva and Epha. And where did they live? They were sent off into the east, into what would be, you know, uh, the heart of the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula and uh, Mesopotamia. And we read here, it says, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham ga gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. Well, concubines, I'm assuming uh, this is also includes Ishmael, right? The sons of his concubines would be Ishmael and the sons that are mentioned here. And they go into what we know as uh, the Middle East these days. Israel is just on the border, on the western border of the Middle East. Okay, uh, now a little further on in Genesis 25, bear with me, you know, usually genealogies aren't that interesting, but sometimes we need to be familiar with some names. So we read about Ishmael's descendants and that he had 12 sons, 12 tribes of Ishmael, just like there would be later on 12 tribes of Jacob. And the first son is named uh, Nevayot, and the second son is named Kedar. And then we read a little bit more about Ishmael. It's not that important, other than to know that they settled again also in the east, in the direction of Assyria. Now, so are you familiar with where Genesis 25 tells us about the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Keturah? And please bear in mind the promise God made to Abraham as for the one I have named. God will hear, I have heard. All right. Now, how does this fit in with God's plan? Well, remember I was saying how 20 years ago I was reading Genesis 17 and I read that portion of Scripture and it was like I'd never read it before? Well, two weeks ago, same thing happened to me again. So, you know, I've been a walker with the Lord since 1978, and I'm still saying, huh, that's in the Bible. I never read it before, even though I've read it a thousand times. <laughs> Maybe not a thousand times, but hundreds of times. And this is from Isaiah 60. Now, Isaiah 60 is very well known, especially, I would think, in a congregation like this. You guys are familiar with Isaiah 60, arise and shine, for your light has come. Glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the land. Gross darkness covers the people, but the Lord has risen upon you. It's a beautiful promise of Israel's restoration. Certainly, you know, Dean By and I sometimes preach together. We preach on Isaiah 60 all the time. Because if you look at especially verses 4 and 5, it's all about Aliyah. And it's all about the wealth of the nations. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar. And your daughter shall be carried on the hip. You know, it's just like Isaiah 49 about your sons. The sons carried on the shoulders of the Gentiles and in the arms of the Gentiles. Here they're coming from afar and your daughters are being carried on the hip. You shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exalt because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. And, you know, if you're in any sort of Christian Zionist ministry or Messianic Jewish ministry, yes, we're talking about the wealth of the nations and this is God's will that the wealth of the nations come to Israel. And, you know, we like to emphasize these things. And, hey, this is the word of God. It's all good. This is actually the pattern that God has established. He is restoring the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the most distant lands under heaven back to the land of Israel. And he is bringing uh, the wealth of the nations to Israel. And we certainly see this. Yes, amen. And we're called into this. Amen. But... It's the next two verses that I want to focus on. Uh, verses 6 and 7. 
look at this. Talking about the wealth of the nations. You know, usually we're, we, when we think about the wealth of the nations, we think about, you know, North America and Europe and maybe, uh, you know, uh, the Far East. But here we have this image of the multitudes of camels shall cover you and the young camels of Midian. Now, who is Midian? Son of Keturah. And Epha, who's Epha? Grandson of Keturah. And all those from Sheva, another grandson of Keturah, you know, Queen of Sheba, right? She lived down on the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. She brought her wealth to Solomon, but this is much later. There's this prophecy of them bringing gold and frankincense, the wealth of the nations, but then there's something else here that they bring. They shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Now, this, is, this word, besorah, is, you know, in modern Hebrew, we talk about this is the gospel. Besorah means good news, a good report. How, Isaiah 52, how lovely on the feet of the mountains are those who bring good news. The same word here. Isaiah 61, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. Same word. Who's bringing the good news? Wow. The sons and grandsons of Keturah who come from Arabia. Isn't that interesting? They're bringing the praises of the Lord. You see, God's got a plan. And, you know, we talk in Romans 11, 11 about that salvation has come to the Gentiles in order to provoke Israel to jealousy. And, and I have to say, uh, you know, this is coming from the man who put this conference on, Dr. Fasil Malik. And God gave him a great revelation that this provocation to jealousy, yes, it's from all the nations of the world, from every tribe, tongue, and kindred, but there is a special role for those from the Middle East to provoke Israel to jealousy by bringing the good news to those who return back to the land. Can you imagine this? They are the ones who will bring the good news, the praises of the Lord. And let's keep reading. Because the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you, and the rams of Naviot shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will beautify my beautiful house. What is bringing glory and honor and beauty to the house of God? The offerings, the worship of the sons of Ishmael. And God says, they will be accepted on my altar. And it will bring beauty to my beautiful house. Could you see this incredible reunification of the brothers, of the sons of Sarah and Hagar and Keturah all coming together and it is part of God's great plan of restoration for the people of Israel. There's more to it than just the wild donkey part. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you know, when you think about this, this is like, come on, really? Can this actually happen? But is there anything too difficult for the Lord? I mean, you know, in this whole mix of Genesis 16, 17, and 21, you got Genesis 18, where God tells Abraham and Sarah, is there anything too difficult for me? And what's the answer? Is there anything too difficult? No. You are the God of all flesh. There is nothing too difficult for you. Even Yeshua says, you know, with men, these things are impossible. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. So, yeah, my brothers and sisters, there is salvation happening 
in the Middle East these days like it never happened before. It's, we can't look in the records of, of missions and find a time when Yeshua would appear to people in a dream over and over and over again and, and proclaim the gospel himself. I mean, that's not the pattern. The pattern is we go in his name and preach the gospel. But yet there's this special grace on the sons of Ishmael, on the sons of Keturah, where God is revealing himself directly to them, even as the angel of the Lord found Hagar in the wilderness. He's finding them as well. And it's all to bring this about. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60 is about Israel's restoration, but it's also about the reunification of all the children of Abraham. Wow. So, it's amazing, folks. Excuse me. But, you know, if it's just something interesting, I, I fear that, you know, that, that's, that's not really what God wants from us. It's just like some people, you know, they hear the message of Israel and they get a, you know, they, they find, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> but then they just, that's the end of it. But God is wanting for us to participate with his purposes. Amen? And so what I am hoping this will do, one, perhaps you're like me, and you've got this sort of, all you see is the wild donkey with his hand against others and everybody's hands against him. You know, this can happen, especially for believers who love Israel. We, you know, w we consider those who are in opposition to Israel as our enemies. We can take on offense. I mean, you see this sometimes. I, I've seen this. We must never do that. First of all, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But we need to see that there's a greater plan here. Yeah, there's terrible things happening. There's strife. There's confusion. There's all sorts of oppression, spiritual oppression. All sorts of bad things are happening. But God, who does the impossible, will bring them to his beautiful house. And they, the house will be made even more beautiful because of it. So I hope we'll have a mind shift. And also, as we stand on the walls of Jerusalem as watchmen, calling out for Israel's restoration, may we include the call, Lord, send the sons of Keturah with the good news, the praises of God, to your people. May you use them to provoke Israel to jealousy. Could you imagine? I mean, what could provoke Jewish people more to jealousy than those who at one time hated them saying, your God is my God. Wherever you go, I will go. Whew. Incredible. So there is something so exciting here. Truly, <laughs> maybe this is why Dean interrupted us, just to remind us we are living in the most exciting days since the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. We're seeing things that have no other generation has ever seen, and you are part of it, my brothers and sisters. May you be encouraged to know that God is the God of the impossible. And what he has said, he will do. Amen. Blessings to you all. God bless.